So if I could ask uh, our panelists to come up to the uh, to the front, uh, the speakers as well as the uh, additional panelists, and um, our additional panelists include uh, Kojo Elena Topa uh, Johnson from University of Pennsylvania and the Association of Molecular Pathology, uh, David Larson from Stanford University, and Dana Segal from uh, Crico Strategies. And what we will do is lead off, if we could, uh, and ask uh, each one to maybe speak for five minutes and give their perspective, particularly about uh, peer learning approaches. And uh, we'll begin uh, with Kojo. Thank you very much. And this is always a um, fascinating forum to attend and uh, to receive the diversity of opinion and um, frequently uh, a spiritual engagement from members of the audience and the, and the panel. And frequently the conversations go beyond the um, room. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to participate. So um, I, I'm a um, board certified anatomic uh, and clinical pathologist. I have a subspecialty certification in hematopathology and molecular pathology. Uh, I, my entire career as a pathologist, I've practiced within the context of an ivory tower. Uh, the reason I'm giving you this perspective is that, um, we, you know, with several um, different kinds of board certifications in a uh, singular practice setting, uh, you can see the constraints that are associated with us being able to transfer the amount of knowledge that is necessary to be able to address the core question this whole forum is about, which is how do we even out uh, the variability in practice that occurs within the ivory tower and in the community? I, I think that's, that's a fundamental question that if, if we don't remember anything that we've talked about all through today, that's, that's uh, something that I'd, uh, I'd like to um, uh, be sure that we all uh, recall. Um, when I um, took my uh, board exams, and um, uh, Ritu Nair, who uh, shared a desk uh, with me when uh, we were fellows at the NIH several, not too long ago, <laughs> um, uh, did an excellent job in, I mean, uh, sort of outlining the fundamental principles that the professional organizations provide in the educational process. And something else that's evolved from that is the necessity uh, for lifelong learning uh, as a professional. So when I took my uh, board exams, uh, maybe a, about a couple of decades ago, uh, what I do today uh, in um, genomic diagnostics um, really didn't exist. What occupies most of my time today in genomic diagnostics uh, really didn't exist. So if I went exclusively by that credentialing, uh, I would be grossly inadequate. And I, um, I work at the University of Pennsylvania, and I uh, direct uh, an operation that um, is similar to one that would exist in large tertiary centers uh, that do genomic diagnostics. So um, the question that I've had is, it, is it um, relevant or fair to expect the same um, amount of sophistication in the communities, and I'm, I'm looking at this from a different angle, or should we be facilitating access to um, expensive, sophisticated, and complex testing uh, that would be available in a tertiary academic centers such as mine? Um, I think there are two schools of thought about that. I think if you take into consideration that the vast majority of care that is given to um, patients in the oncology setting occurs um, in the community, it becomes um, really impractical to duplicate the kind of uh, complexity of operations that you heard people describing in, uh, at Brigham and Women's or Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think it may be more effective in evening the quality of care to develop tools and mechanisms for the physicians to recognize what the limits of their practice are and um, appropriately refer to centers just as mine. So um, we're given five minutes for this. I can see the clock going down. I don't want to be 
the person who's held responsible for being between you and lunch. Uh, but, uh, happy to uh, discuss this in uh, greater detail. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kojo.